guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the most interesting folks focused on the big picture and the big future. Today, we've got somebody who's doing just that, and he's been doing it for a while, John Stossel on the program. John, thanks for coming. Good to be here, or not be here, but be here electrically. Technology, right? That's um. I want to get into a lot of things with you, but the first area I want to start is how did you, how, what's, what's your background? How did you become one of the largest supporters of libertarianism? How did, how'd you join the movement? What's your story? Uh, not naturally. I graduated college having been taught by my professors that government could solve problems with programs and the big one at the time was the war on poverty. It's a crime that in this rich country, so many people are still poor, but we could fix this with these programs. So I started out, I accidentally landed a TV reporting job in Portland, Oregon. And because I'm a stutterer, I, I wasn't covering today's news. I, I wanted to avoid competing with the political reporters. And, and I covered those programs and I watched them fail. And I'm embarrassed to say I, I won 19 Emmy Awards cheering on government solutions to problems. But only after 15 years of seeing the laws I called for, and some even that were passed because of my stories, they didn't do any good. They just made everything cost more, and made life more complex, and added work for lawyers. And I started reading more and tried the conservative press and didn't like that because they seemed to want to go to war with other countries and police the bedroom. Um, and actually, Eugene, I will want that nearby. Um, and I discovered Reason Magazine, and that was an epiphany because that's a libertarian magazine. And it was like, wow, these people really understand it much better than I do. I've been a fan of reason ever since. How do you deal with that? The fact that you do have such a big, a big shift in your, in your political career, in your, in your views. I think it's important to be able to change our opinions. And I think a lot of people struggle with that these days. Was that tough for you back then? Well, no, because the liberal solutions I was taught at Princeton weren't making sense. It, it was uncomfortable. And then to find something that really made sense and to see how, oh yeah, that's what built early America when we grew from a poor country to the most successful country in the world, this works. And I became like a born again free market person. It's, it's empowered me and energized me. I think there's a lot to be taken from libertarianism in terms of the values, but I think there's some issues as well. And I want to get into some of those. How much... There are no issues. It's perfect. Whenever something's perfect, it's not. It's a utopia is a dystopia, but that's a that's a whole nother story. But in terms of in terms of government, I'm not a big government fan, but I'm also not libertarian. I, I found that by growing up in the U.S. and having such an incompetent government, it kind of pushes us towards libertarianism. But I, I would argue that at least in Europe, people seem to get something for their money when it comes to government and taxes. Uh, they get something, but they also get stagnation. How much is invented in Europe? Look at the wonderful recent inventions of our day, Facebook, and Google, and the fact that we're doing this video uh, on whatever, on Zoom or something, um, Skype. It's, it all came out of the metropolitan areas farthest from Washington, D.C., because governments weren't there to crush them. And, and now Europe is kind of crushing some of them with these right to be forgotten rules. So, I mean, I disagree. It's true. If you spend trillions of dollars on welfare programs, some people are going to be helped. But they also teach dependency and make life much worse for people, especially the poor. So I, I know I looked up some GDP stats just to have a little bit, because you've got a lot more of a background than I do, and I can respect that. But G Germany's GDP, 44% is the government. U.S.'s GDP, 396 That's the difference between socialism and capitalism. But in Germany, people have a safety net. They have health insurance. 
They have a lot of things. How do you think about that kind of stuff where there are some things where it feels like free market solutions fail? <laughs> Wait a second. You lumped a whole bunch of things together. Um, free market solutions failing at the end. I mean, by and large, they haven't failed. They provide us with most, with most of the good stuff we have. Yeah, America already has a big welfare state, um, 39% versus 44. If you are poor and sick in America, you're eligible for Medicaid. It's not like we don't have a medical social safety net. And people object to the idea that you have to be poor. They're saying the middle class should get this stuff paid for. Germany and the rest of Europe, when if you're talking medical care, it's true, it's pretty good. But they don't invent the drugs. They don't invent the MRIs. The innovation comes from the greedy, profit-seeking people in free market places, which does include Germany and Sweden also. There's just less of it there but every time the government takes over these things you also lose something also they're germans they're a homogeneous culture that loves to work and that makes countries like that a little easier to govern it, it is definitely easier to govern countries like that how do you think speaking of how do you think we should handle that so it's easier to govern but you also will have less innovation because you have less diversity, less spontaneity. And if you look at the Fortune 500, a vast majority of the CEOs or a large percentage are immigrants to the U.S. How do we deal with immigration? What are your thoughts on that? My thought is that we should let more people in. We can't have open borders, as some libertarians advocate, because now so many people want to come here because we have a welfare state. They want to come here to freeload. And some people want to come here to murder us. So open borders would not be a good thing. But if we made it so people who want to come here to assimilate and to work could, there would be less cheating. It's like the dumb drug laws. By, by making it illegal, you force people to sneak in. We once uh, researched what it would take for an immigrant to come here legally. And if you're a computer engineer from India, I think you could get here legally in about a dozen years. But if you're a 20 year old looking to start your life, that's not so good. If you're a Mexican teenager, the numbers came out to about 114 years. So there's no legal way that an unskilled Mexican worker can come to America. So people come here illegally or allow work programs where they come here to work and go back. But by giving them a piece of paper that says, yeah, we check you out a little and you're legal and you have to go back after a certain time, you take away the black markets and that would be better. Okay, so you're basically saying short term work visas, at least as a, a carryover into having some type of path to a long term green card, etc. And let immigrants in at a good rate rates we've had before in the past and favor people who have skills. So like Canada does basically. Yes. Yeah. Canada has a great system there, at least comparatively when it comes to immigration. It was so frustrating. We, we have friends here that they, they own two restaurants. They're doing incredibly well. They've been going for a decade just trying to get the, the green card and the citizenship stuff all sorted out. Why do you think it is so hard? I mean, we talked about, about the demand, but it can't only be demand. How much of it is demand and how much of it is trying to protect the backyard? Oh, it's a combination. It's certainly we do want to protect our backyards. And I don't know where the data is now on percentage of people we're taking, but uh, when Trump repealed some of these work visas, I think it's a mistake. And, and then more people try to cheat. Yeah, you see PhD graduate students having to get kicked back to their country because they don't have a job immediately and you can't get an H-1B V or H whatever the terminology is for a skilled worker visa. Do you right. think do you think that that could ultimately be something that starts to send the US into a spiral? I think there's a lot of things that are spiraling right now on the on the precipice of popping, but I'm curious to see what your thoughts are on the biggest risks to the US today. Debt. 
and increasing belief in government as the answer. Consu- consumer debt or government debt? Government debt. I mean, I've been saying this, this is going to break <laughs> soon. I've been wrong. I've accurately predicted 15 of the last two recessions. But you can't keep spending more than money is going to come in. The rubber band can stretch and stretch, but at some time it's going to break. And my generation's the problem. I'm on Medicare. I go to the doctor now and it's sort of like a party. It's, it's, it's the social life of the people in the waiting room. They never discuss price. Nobody asks, no, no doctor mentions it. And a month later, I'll get a bill for some procedure that I have to co-pay $14 or something. Um, there's no market incentive. And I rudely refuse to die. And people my age keep living longer. When Social Security was designed, most people didn't even live to age 65. It was meant for the minority who would live so long that they'd outrun their savings. And now it's this entitlement, as we call it, and it's just unsustainable. It's not complicated math. It's just arithmetic. There aren't enough young people working who are going to be able in the next 10, 20 years to pay for all of us old geezers retirement, Social Security and Medicare. And a big part of that is because the prices are trumped up because you have a three system of payers, insurers, and then you have the individuals themselves. No one actually feels the hurt. So prices continue to rise and then you have discounting on the back doors. How do you deal with that from a libertarian perspective of free markets? I I know I've lived in Europe and they have great systems. It's called regulations and they regulate a lot of what this can be and they have a single payer system. How would it look like from a less is more type perspective? Well, just again, to quibble with your assumptions, uh, Canada and England and I think Norway have a single payer system, but Germany, Switzerland, many of the other countries don't that many people get private insurance to supplement their, yes, we'll take care of you government care, but that care is maybe 10 years old. Governments don't innovate. The incentive, I mean, there's people in government are often just as smart as people in the private sector, but the difference is the incentives. In the private sector, if you aren't improving every second, some competitor cleans your clock and you go out of business. In government, if you make a change, you're in trouble. So maybe you can get a change with an act of Congress or an election in four years or eight years, but it's very hard to innovate. So Europe has good medical systems, but they don't have the latest care. And I forgot your question as I was quibbling with it. How how we could fix that. So for instance, my my wife's Swiss, we lived there. I needed health insurance. We signed up. It took 10 minutes. There were three different prices. You can have high, you can have medium, you can have low essentially. And they are guaranteed regulations of these are the things they have to cover. There's not that fine print that says, oh, shit, I just got pregnant and my wife's not covered. So I have a $200,000 medical bill. So when Obamacare was coming, everybody talked about coverage. But shouldn't the goal be care? Coverage. Results, not even care. Results. Results, but a step back care. And even in America, if you show up at the hospital, they don't turn you away. People get care. People worry about it. It's a source of a lot of anxiety. And the answer we libertarians say is a market, which means people pay for their own care. And obviously that's not going to happen here. People think that's an outrage. You shouldn't. Nobody can afford it. Well, so let me, let's break that down. How come people can't afford it? We can afford houses, clothing, movies, expensive restaurant. We can afford everything else because when there's a market, the prices come down. And that's happened in the tiny sliver of healthcare where there is a market. LASIK eye surgery and plastic surgery. You go to those doctors and the waiting rooms are beautiful. LASIK eye surgery prices have come down while the quality of the treatment has gone up. It's because there's a market. The doctors give out their cell phone numbers because they want to please the customer. In America, we have the worst of all worlds. We, we have government and private insurance companies paying seven out of $8. So the customer is not you. The customer is either the government or an insurance company. 
And then you have to add all the bureaucracy. The insurance company has all that horrible paperwork because they figure some of us will try to cheat them. And they use the paperwork to try to prevent that. Medicare barely does that. And so people do cheat more. And that raises the cost. The only thing that holds costs down is when you're spending your own money and people care about it. What would happen to the poor people, people with chronic conditions? Well, I think if we had a system like that, rich people would step up and take care of poor people. There would be charity hospitals. They might be religion based. But there used to be lots more of those before the welfare state came. How many people died during the Depression in America? How many people starved? Almost no one. Why? The country as a whole was much poorer then. Food was a higher percentage of people's incomes. But there were 18,000 mutual aid societies all over the country that helped people. And they were cliquish and racist. It was like Koreans helping Koreans and blacks helping blacks. But they would get together in a group and they knew better who, if Joel needed help and Jim needed a kick in the butt. And that's better than a one size fits all government system. And it took care of the poor and needy. And if we had it now when the country is so much richer and you got billionaires competing on how to spend charity money in a way that will make them feel good, they would take care of the poor. What country would you say is the most libertarian in the world? Hong Kong, Singapore, despite the government's social repression, but economically, it's more libertarian. There are a couple think in India. No, no. Okay. Because part of libertarian is rule of law that if you own something, the government won't just come in and take it from you. And in India, they do that sometimes. Uh, there are lists of economically free countries put out by the Fraser Institute and Heritage and Cato. America used to be in the top five. Now we're about 15, I think. And at the top every year, are Hong Kong, Singapore, Canada is ahead of us, New Zealand, Australia do well, Switzerland. And those are all those are all much more socialized than the U.S. Why do you think that there's that weird? Then this is kind of what I come back to is at least in those countries, people get something for the tax dollars they spend. I've I've interviewed entrepreneurs. I've talked to them and they're like. Yeah, I'm paying 40, 50 percent, but I feel good about it because I, I know what I'm getting. I'm getting my public transit. I'm getting better schooling. The schooling in the U.S. is falling behind. Public transit's a joke. Safety, crime. There's just so many things that seem to be rolling the wrong direction in the U.S. And it's, it's a scary future to consider. I say you're wrong about everything you just said. First of all, it's not getting worse in the United States. Crime has been going down for years, though. So if you listen to the media, you'd think it was getting worse. Um, things have been getting better. We're living longer. There are fewer wars in the world and there's more media and media tends to cover the bad news because no one's out by the back fence gossiping about who's being faithful to their spouse. It's not news if the planes land safely, but the plane crash is bad news. So we think things are getting worse. And um, in Switzerland, well, you have Swiss people. You have a very homogeneous group of people. And you have my ancestors with the tradition of hard work and lots of money. They spend more on schooling than, than America even. Switzerland's first, we're second. Um, they get a lot. They have a lot, I so it makes it easier. I remember your whole question. So just just, in, just in terms of in terms of the U.S., a lot of the major markers. So if you look at the health longevity, the top 10 percent versus the bottom 10 percent in the U.S., there's a 10 year differential. The opioid crisis is actually making long term life expectancy decrease in the U.S. for something like three years in a row. You have not necessarily crime levels increasing, but the U.S. is the only major first world country where you have people where you have cities that are almost war zones and areas. And that's because people are growing up with the conditions where it's do or die. It's get on the corner and sell drugs, be a rap star, or find your way out through sports. 
or grab a gun. Oh, come on, Matt. That's bullshit. Is Atlanta like that where you are? Parts of I, parts of Atlanta oh, are. I've had pe- I've had people on. He was the valedictorian of his class. He's from Camden, and he said that the teacher said to him towards the towards the end when they were getting ready to graduate, um, "You're basically going to end up in prison, or you're going to end up dead." And I, I take some I take some of this with a grain of salt, but a lot of it, it's just that. I f- we have scarier cities. We have more homeless people, and yet it's the richest country in the world. Why is there such a dichotomy there? Culture is a lot of it. You have idiot school teachers in Camden. I assume you mean Camden, New Jersey, one of the poorest districts in the country, working for government schools who wrongly tell this kid that he's probably going to go to jail. Because really, any kid in the ghetto who wears a shirt like on a tie um, is not going to be viewed by police as the enemy. Any kid who who goes, who attends school, um, kids who have two parents, they do well. They get out of poverty. And in Switzerland, you have it in Europe, you have a different culture. People say, we spend more on medical care, but we die younger. And I'm mixing so many things. You mentioned the lifespans coming down in America. It's true there in the recent years, I don't think it's three, there was a drop because of white men largely, uh, actually men largely killing themselves. And a lot of it had to do with the opioid epidemic. So that's a small blip, but the trend has been longer and better lives. And the Europeans live longer and spend less on healthcare mainly for three reasons. They're not obese like many Americans are. They drive less, so they kill each other less on the highways. And they're less likely to shoot each other because we have a culture of guns and more violent murders. That's part of our culture. That's not government rules making that happen. How do we change that? How do we change that culture? Pardon? How do we change that? It's... We have so many mass shootings. Well, you know, crazy people, I don't have an answer to. There there are haters and crazy people. I don't know how to... Everyone has crazy people. We we only have a monopoly on access to assault weapons. We're the only country where you can not be a soldier and you can show up like a soldier easily. Well, in Switzerland, everybody's required to own a gun. They did, they did get rid of that. But yeah, everyone went through... everyone Everyone went through military service and were required to have a gun. Well, what you call assault weapons, and we're going to argue about those definitions there, um, I, I'm told there really is no such thing. Are you talking about repeater rifles? Well, rifles where you pull the trigger, or I'm not going to even get into that. But if you ban it, what good is that going to do? People will 3D print the thing at home. You're going to have the cops go to every door and confiscate those weapons? That's basically what Australia did, and they got rid of almost all gun crime. No, they they just had a big mass murder in Australia. They didn't yeah, but we have one, we have. I mean, if you look at the stats, we have essentially one a day. If you're looking at multi, uh, th- multi-person shootings in the U.S., this is so wrong, Maxim. Would you give me the real gun statistics so I can fight back here with the Matt, who's saying things which I think are wrong? Yeah, well, it's a myth that the U.S. Here's this is a. Maxim Lott, who's, who knows a lot about guns. He's very tall, so he has to <laughs> bend over to be in there. Hey, one of the producers. Um, yeah, we did a video. It's a myth that the U.S. has the most mass shootings. Um, actually, uh, that's just a miscounting because they went back in time and looked at all the mass shootings, and they missed a lot of shootings in foreign languages and things like that. But a number of European countries have more shootings uh, more deaths due to mass shootings than the U.S. does. Anyway, I accuse you of having some misinformation there. If you want to see our videos where we, I think, give you the facts on these things, they're all at johnsossel.com or on my YouTube channel. Okay, I got I to gotta push back a little on that. Where was the last, yeah. where was the last school shooting in a foreign country? Where was the last school shooting in a foreign country? I... 
there was the Norway shooting where that was year, that was years ago. The crazy people. the crazy Christian guy. That was like three years ago. All right, we're we're gonna get the answer. To that hang on while I deal with a repair guy here for one second. No worries. Uh, hi Mario, I'm not gonna be free for another hour. Shall I call them and have them let you in the building? All right, I I will do that. Uh, can you wait until um, four four o'clock? Yeah, we're almost to four o'clock. Okay, thanks. Bye. All right, Matt. I but go ahead. No worry. I would be very, very, very skeptical of those stats just because of how often it is happening in the U.S. It's happening. I mean several dozen times a year at this point, if you count universities, or at least a dozen. It, it's just... Um, it's... We're, a, we're a big country, and we have access to guns. It's true. Uh, watch the video. I'll check out the video. I wanted, I wanted to dive in as well. Have your thoughts changed at all on climate change? A little bit. There are... I was very alarmed at one... Yeah, they changed, changed several times. I was very alarmed when I read the first stuff. Then I saw how thin that was, and I thought it might not even be true that it's warming. But look, I mean, you can't have doubts about climate change. Climate changes, always has, and always will. But then there are four parts. Um, is it getting warmer? Pretty certain it is. Uh, is man doing it? And I've come from thinking we aren't to probably we are making a significant contribution with our greenhouse gases. But remember, the climate has been warming for several hundred years before we were putting out greenhouse gases. We were coming out of a little ice age about 800 years ago, and uh, that's without the effect of man. But let's say we're, we're responsible for half of it, which is possible. So is it a crisis and can we do anything about it? And I say probably not and no. In other words, what's a crisis? You got a million people dying in Africa of malaria every year. That's a crisis. You got two million dying from dysentery. I mean, that's a crisis. You got all these countries going broke, so they're not going to be able to pay your Social Security and Medicare. That's a crisis warming we can adjust to that and we can adjust to it better if we're wealthy enough to move people off the coast if we have to to raise houses to build dikes i mean you get floods that kill thousands of people in bangladesh and equally desperate rains that kill no one usually with the exception of katrina in america because we have Wealth, wealthier is healthier. We have cars so we can drive away, dikes to divert the water, radios to hear about the floods so you could get out of the way. But finally, can the stuff we're doing now, spending hundreds of billions of dollars on subsidies for wind power and solar power and electric cars, going to make any difference? No, it's just an utter scam, disgusting scam, because even the IPCC says, this stuff isn't going to do much. And the government promises in the Paris Climate Agreement, we're not even going to make a dent on that. And China and India are continue to build new coal plants. So I say better to keep an eye on it, keep studying it, and hope that if it really is a problem, we will be wealthy enough to handle it. I think we disagree a little bit here. I think it definitely is a problem, just even looking at the, the the cascading effects that come from the increased temperature, the change in the salinity of the oceans, the melting of a lot of essentially Ukraine and the former USSR, the methane that gets released. We have a, you, you have a situation that's like a flywheel where something happens and it gets worse and worse and worse because of the, all of those contributing factors. I think we can play around with the percentage for how much humanity's contributed, but it's definitely happening. I'm glad that you're at least someone who is willing to, to say that. I, I see some people, I don't know how they don't see that happening, but how do we- your, your cascading point, I've heard that so much. That was about the dyes in food and the pesticide residues were causing the cancer epidemic. 
which doesn't exist, by the way, despite all these new chemicals in the world, there is less cancer incident. One after the other, um, Y2K was going to crash all the airplanes, flesh-eating bacteria, Ebola, West Nile virus, SARS, just nonstop scares. And the scientists are genuinely alarmed. And when I, as a reporter, go to interview them, I was nearly in a panic. Cell phones causing brain tumors, electric uh, power lines causing cancer. Paul Brodeur won a Pulitzer Prize for his two-part series in The New Yorker for that. Overpopulation was going to starve everybody by 20 years ago. It doesn't happen. We adjust. And I think we will adjust to climate change. If we work towards preparing for it, I would agree with you. If we don't, if we're rich enough to say, holy shit, this is a problem. We better address this now. Then maybe there'll be some carbon suck machine we'll have invented by then. And then we'll do it. So what do, what, do, what, what do you want to do now? What do you want to take government money from? I would get rid of all of the subs, all of the subsidies that go towards coal and go towards high emission activities, and I would put those towards renewable activities. Just changing that, you would kill companies that are destroying the world, and you would create ones that could have the opportunity to help save it. The only real subsidies that go to oil and coal are the depreciation allowance, which goes to any mining or mineral company. There are no direct handouts to those companies, and there are huge ones per ounce of energy produced that go to wind and solar already. They go to make Al Gore a zillionaire. I've heard the Al Gore thing a lot. I think we'll agree to disagree on that one because I don't think we're going to get to somewhere where we can have a have, right. have an agreement on that but I'm curious so libertarian fiscal responsibility what are your thoughts on blockchain it's good to have an alternative have something the government doesn't control did you get in early not early enough but I bought some bitcoin when it was about 120 I had a guy talking about it on my TV show when it was at nine. Boy, I wish I'd bought them. And what do you see about the future of of cryptocurrencies, of blockchains? Personally, unfortunately, I would very much like to see them stay decentralized. But I feel like with the power that government and big business has, so Facebook will release their little Libra coin, I think it's going to end up being a centralized commodity, which is almost the anti and but it's almost as bad as it gets for libertarians as having a government with that kind of surveillance power. I don't think blockchain is so easy to centralize. And again, you're mixing words, government and big business control. Either, well, either one would be applicable. So if Facebook controls it, then the government's able to go to Facebook and say, hey, Zuck, we're going to put you in jail or you're going to give us this information. If government controls it, they don't need Zuckerberg. But he potentially threatens U.S. government if he was to create the coin that became the worldwide US or the worldwide currency standard that would threaten the dollar. Maybe. And you know, his is not real blockchain. His is based on a basket of currencies. But the point to remember when you lump them together that I wanted to make is that government has the guns. And people say, well, you libertarians, you're always worried about big government. Why aren't you worried about big business? Because Big business can't use force. The only way they can get my money is to persuade me to give it to them. So if Facebook, I decide is evil, then I'll stop giving them my information. We have choices. We only have one government, and that's why government is dangerous. We have choices, but collectively choices get made. So you might not decide to do something, but if everyone else decides to do something, that doing something, it's it's the it's the same problem with climate change. Of I'm not going to recycle because my neighbor's not recycling. So, shit, it can't be can't be helped anyways. How would recycling affect climate change? I, I'm just coming up with an example. It's like we all have a toilet and we all take a shit in it, and no one decides to clean the toilet because it's not my toilet. It's the it's the collective action problem of everyone having to do something at once. So you well, have collective action if. Nobody washes a rental car. If I own the car, if it's my personal property, then I'll flush that toilet. You will, but this is actually, here's an interesting 
analogy that I heard once. What is the most valuable thing to have while you're traveling around a third world country? Uh, an American passport, cash, a gun. I don't know. Those are all pretty. The old's are all pretty good. They were going a little bit simpler. Toilet paper, because you're going to wind up somewhere where you got to take a dump, and they don't have toilet paper. So bringing around toilet paper, you're in the most scarce of places, and abundance is just having access to that toilet paper. You don't want to have to carry it around. You just want to have access to it. So if the restaurant you go to, if the jungle that you go to, if all these places have toilet paper, that's abundance, not having to carry it around. That's scarcity. So right now we're living in a world fueled by scarcity where I have to have my house. You have to have yours. You've got to have your car. I've got to have a bike. You have to have your XYZ set of clothes, your XYZ set of entertainment devices. That That's scarcity because... If we could pool our resources, how often do you have to use a drill? If you buy a drill and I buy a drill, we're buying the least common denominator because maybe we use a drill once every couple months versus if we buy a drill together, we can buy a nice one and then we can use it each once a month. Same deal. What do you think about that? That's what the sharing economy does. But it only works because Uber wants to make a profit and sets up a system where the drivers get rated. So you have an incentive to behave well. If you have a commune and zillions of people have proposed their utopias, not one has ever succeeded. So sharing is nice, but it really works without a profit motive involved. I would agree with that. I have one last question before we jump into the lightning round. I had somebody else on and they were a big proponent of, of free enterprise. Bob Metcalf, he invented the Ethernet, among other things. And he had a statement that I thought was just, I thought it was hard to even hear. And that was extreme inequality is a good thing. And I'm curious to get your thoughts. Um, I bristle at the hard to hear and what you want to be in a safe space. I think we ought to be able to hear anything. And that's the open debate that makes life better. I don't think extreme inequality is a good thing. I, I think equality is a better thing. But extreme financial inequality is going to happen wherever people are free. And it's a byproduct of freedom. Some people are smarter, or cleverer, or luckier. And they, thanks to compound interest, some of them are going to multiply their wealth. But I don't mind that Jeff Bezos has so much or Bill Gates has so much. A lot of them will give to charities that may help people. And Bezos, though I despise some of the things he's done, gives me cheap stuff without my having to go to the store. He invented something better that I like to use. How do we how do we handle that growth of Amazon? Amazon is becoming I know you said you're not someone who's worried about businesses, but Amazon is consuming everything. Bezos is trying to scrape a little bit off of the top of every transaction of everything that happens, at least in the U.S. and ideally worldwide. And he's not doing a bad job of it. Then fine. I don't think he'll eat up everything. And if he starts to deprive us of something good, people will scream and they'll buy other businesses that compete with Amazon that will spring up to please cons please consumers better. And in the very end, if it really is against the public interest, we have antitrust laws and government has the guns and all the politicians care about is getting reelected. So the majority of politicians want to smash Amazon. They will. What do you think about getting reelected in the election term cycles? I know you were, you were at Fox for a while. You've been in the thick of politics, in the thick of people jockeying for position. How do you think about the system we have and how we could improve it? I wouldn't try to improve it. It's created the most successful country ever. It's not perfect, but I would say why tamper with that? Uh, um, politics is disgusting. I hate most politicians. These are people who spend all their time sucking up to rich people and smiling in a phony way and shaking hands with strangers desperate with their lust for power so they can rule over us. Yuck, I, I don't want to participate in that, but it's a necessary evil. But let's just keep it small enough where we can keep an eye on it. 
how would we do that? Would it be more power to state governments, less power to federal governments? Well, you can argue that local government's better because you can more easily keep an eye on it. But because uh, it's small and people don't pay much attention, you do get horrible, corrupt dynasties in local governments, too. So the best way is just if government isn't small, then you don't have to spend zillions lobbying to control it. If if government isn't giving money to farmers, to cotton farmers and wheat farmers, then then they don't have to spend all that money trying to influence the politicians to keep it company. But look, America grew the fastest when government was 1% of GDP. You're now talking Switzerland being, what you say, 51% and we're 44%? Just shrink it. Just stop the growth and we can grow out of our debt. But instead, the politicians all talk about the new stuff they're going to give us. I have a video comparing each candidate wants to spend. And it's phenomenal. And, and nobody goes to their state capital and asks a politician about what, what laws have you repealed, Mr. Politician? It's all what laws have you passed? Yeah, you got to kill the old to have the new. Otherwise, you just have cancer. What One last one. UBI, universal basic income, what are your thoughts? It was a reasonable idea when it came from Milton Friedman because the welfare state's so inefficient. We spend about $40,000 per, per person on these welfare programs, and some help people. One helped Al Franken's mother when she cheated on it, got a start in life. Um, but they're terribly inefficient. If you replace them by giving everybody $10,000, $40,000, it might be a good idea, but I don't think it would because some people would snort it all up and we are not going to leave them starving on the streets. So then there'd be a new movement for more welfare programs to take care of them. The current crop of people pushing it, like Yang, they want to put it on top of our existing welfare. No, he, wa he wants to kill the existing ones. Oh, he does? Mm -hmm. Well, good. Yeah, that's, a re that's a, an idea worth considering. Yeah, because there is there is so much bloat, especially in, I, I mean, government in, in general builds paperwork very, very well. Let's, yeah. go, let's go to the lightning round. Sound good? Sure. Two last questions. Media, what's the future? You've got your own little media empire you've built, both in conventional and now on your own. What's it look like going forward for the media? Beats me. I mean, clearly the old model is going to go away. I would think there would be an opportunity for someone to give you more balanced stuff. I mean, right now, we've all fallen for the algorithms, which are so genius in social media that if I spend a fraction of an ounce more time on this Facebook story and my, on my feed, they're going to give me more like that. And we tend to get more confirmation bias for our bad ideas. And this is contributing to the raised anger that's going on now. I have an app on my phone called Read Across the Aisle that tries to give you both sides. The New York Times, which kind of used to do that, is now the reporters are going for clickbait and they're just bashing Trump constantly. But I would think there's room for a new Atlantic or Forbes to, or the Wall Street Journal, which does give you both sides. To That people will pay for that, I hope, or pay for my stuff. Yeah, it's, it's tough because people don't want to pay for it, but someone's paying for it. It's either you, society, or something else larger. Last, right. We don't last even want to sign up for it because we think something bad will happen. Yeah, we're going to get the email spam or something. So, cancer. What was it like going through? What did you learn? Uh, I got uh, from unnecessary medical testing because my wife made me go for a scan. They found a little thing in my lung that they took out stage one. Uh, it's scary. And you think about dying. I, my way of dealing with it is denial. I just try not to think about it. And odds are I'll die of something else. A lot of things can get us. And a coward dies a thousand deaths. Brave man dies but one. Such a great quote. I have this app on my phone. It's called We Croak, and it basically reminds you five times a day you're going to die and gives you quotes like that because it forces you to live in the moment. John, 
Thanks for coming on. If you had to leave people with one thing before you tell them where to find you, a quote, a call to action, it can be anything, what would it be and why? Go learn from johnstossel.com. We're a jungle gym for your brain. Jungle gym for the brain. I've, I've never heard that one before. It's solid. Thanks for coming on today, John. Bye. And thanks for tuning in, guys. Cheers.